y'all ready? All right. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this beautiful day and for gathering us together to learn more about your word. Um, Lord, I pray that you open up the word to us, give us new insights, and um, flesh out this word for us. We lift this up in your precious son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to do something fun today. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. So um, I'm going to talk about covenants and uh, what they looked like in the ancient Near East. Um, so uh, last week, John covered the fall of humanity and through Adam's disobedience leading to sin and death. Um, but that's not the end of the story, right? So God has a redemption story for humanity in mind from the beginning. Uh, where the fall came through humanity's disobedience, redemption of humanity would come through the obedience of God's begotten son, Jesus. And my Bible fell. Lovely. Um, so I'm going to talk about covenants and their importance in the redemption story. I'm going to make sure that doesn't fall again. So there are four covenants in the Old Testament. Noahic, which we haven't covered yet, we will cover it today. Um, that's in Genesis 8. Um, Abrahamic in Genesis 15. Mosaic in Exodus 19 through 24. And Davidic in 2 Samuel 7. Um, and then, of course, in the New Testament, we have the New Covenant, which isn't, it, it, it's not quite the same as the old ones. Um, and it's set in place by the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Um, so this, covenant deems all the other covenants null and void, though it's important to note that the OT covenants are not unimportant for living a life pleasing to God, right? So there's still importance in the Ten Commandments. There's still importance in the Abrahamic covenant. Um, it's just that we no longer, in order to be saved, we no longer have to keep those covenants as tight. So anyway, um, all right. So a covenant is an ancient Near Eastern ceremony signifying, signifying a binding agreement between two parties. And there's two types of covenants um, in Israel and in the Near East. There is a promissor, promissory covenant, um, which binds the suzerain. So these are called suzerain treaties. Um, the suzerain is the master and the vassal is the servant. Um, and the promissory covenants are unconditional. The obligatory covenants, also known as suzerain treaties, bound the vassal, the servant, to be faithfully obedient to the suzerain, the master. Uh, so in the Bible, most often times it's important to note that the vassal is God. He's the one that is making the covenant with us. We're actually the masters. We're receiving this. So it, it's, a, it's a flip, a flip of power here. So there are six elements to these covenants. Um, and not all the OT covenants have all of these elements, um, but the Mosaic covenant is actually the best example of this. So I'm kind of giving you a sneak preview of what happens in Exodus. Um, okay, so the six, six elements, I kind of liked that Tom had six points and I have six elements here. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, the preamble is the first element. It's the introduction of the speaker. So it describes one who composes the treaty and may include the suzerain's title, mighty attributes, and genealogy. So in Exodus 21 to 2, the, an example of this is, I am the Lord your God. The, histor the second element is the historical prologue. It recounts the events and or relationship between parties leading up to the moment of entering into the covenant, emphasizing the suzerain's kind and generous acts toward the vassal. So in Exodus 20, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? Number three, stipulations. The obligations imposed on the vassal. 
These contain mandates to help the vassal know what is expected of him from the suzerain. So uh, an example of this is the Ten Commandments in Exodus, um, also called the Decalogue. Decalogue means, dec means ten. So it's also called the Decalogue. Um, and that's in Exodus 20. The fourth piece, the document. The treaty would be in, uh, placed in a temple. So think 10 commandments here, because this is a visual for you. 10 commandments, two tablets, the same on front and back, not five on one and five on the other. They're two copies of the same thing. And they're placed in the tabernacle, in the holies of, holies of holies, in the ark, right? So this is a good example of what would happen in a pagan temple. Uh, the whatever, however they wrote it, usually on stone, it would be placed in the um, temple for periodic readings and to remind them of, um, well, in the case of the Ten Commandments, it's to remind the um, Israel, Israelites that they um, were stubborn. <laughs> By reading it over, remind them of their stubbornness. Um, okay, the fifth element, the witnesses. So in polytheistic Near Eastern culture, the witnesses would be a list of gods or elements. So it could be like mountains, rivers, air. Um, an Israelite example of this is in Deuteronomy 30, um, 16 through 30, God instructs Moses to compose a song for Israel as a witness against the people on God's behalf. And then we have curses and blessings. I think you're all pretty familiar with curses and blessings, but um, all treaties specify what the suzerain will do to the vassal who disobeys the stipulations and what blessings he will bestow on him for disobedience. Um, there's a couple other elements, which the, isn't included in the six elements. By the way, I'm getting all of this from a paper, an essay, which I will send out to you all. And it, it is on near, ancient Near Eastern suzerain treaties. That you wrote. I did not write this, no. <laughs> I'm thankful I didn't write it. But I think this is really fascinating. It really, it really does apply to everything. Um, so the, the last... Two other elements are oath and sacred ceremony. And I think these are really important, especially given the biblical context. The ratification of the treaty, which is linked to the blessings and curses section, is the utterance of an oath by the vassal. Uh, we could use um, Exodus 20 as an example. 27. And let me see. You, I'll put, you got it? Yeah. Exodus 20, verse 7. seven. Well, it is the third commandment, right? Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God because the Lord will not Maybe. leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Maybe. No, no, nope. I wrote the wrong, down the wrong thing. Anyway, we'll go on. But um, an oath, a promise by the vassal. And then we have blood sacrifices. So that is the sacred ceremony. And blood sacrifices have happened. I, I looked up the Davidic covenant and I, I didn't see a sacrifice there but um the noahic covenant and the abrahamic and the mosaic all have a sacrifice element um which we will look into so um so not all these elements are found in each one of the covenants found in the old testament but um we're going to examine noah and Abraham today. All right. So picking up where we left off with John last week, uh, when man multiplied on the face of the earth and grew increasingly corrupt, the Lord regretted making man and desired to blot man out. So that's in Genesis 6.6. 6. It's important to note, and Carol Kaminsky is hilarious on this point. She brings in a children's book about Noah. And I didn't have time to find one and re read one to you, so I'm going to describe what she does. Uh, she brings in a children's book, and in most children's books about Noah, it says Noah is a good man. He was a good man, but he wasn't. He was a pagan, 
Uh, he did terrible things, but he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And that's all that was needed. He got grace. So Noah obeyed God's command to build the ark. So he was obedient. He listened to God. He did something probably everyone thought he was crazy. I would admit, I would imagine everyone thought he was crazy for building this gigantic ark. Why? Um, but he was made righteous through faith and is saved by grace. So we'll see that with Abraham as well. Um, prior to God making a covenant with Noah, Noah builds an altar and sacrifices to the Lord. So here's our, our blood sacrifice. Um, and the Lord is pleased, it says, in Genesis eight twenty through 22, declaring he would never again curse the ground because of man. Um, and then God makes a covenant. So God is making the covenant that he would never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And the rainbow is a sign of that covenant between God, Noah, and all mankind. So that's in Genesis 9, 15 through 17. The hope for humanity would come through the son of Noah, Shem's line, leading to Abraham. So here we, on our timeline, we've got Shem at the end, and Shem is Noah's son, but it leads to Abraham. Okay. So... Let's look at Abraham's life on the timeline. So we're going to cover through Genesis 20, 22. No. Yeah, through 22. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, lot, that's a lot of points right there, right? <laughs> so um, like Noah, Abraham is called. He's called out of Ur, which we know is a highly pagan culture, um, and he is called to bring his family to a different land. I mean, like, that's the leap of faith, right? He, he was absolutely, he didn't know about this Lord, this monotheistic God. There are many gods, right? So this is a, kind of shocking, and obviously God must have had some glorious intervention to make himself known to Abraham for him to pick up and do this. So, um, would someone read Genesis 12, 1 through 3? And then um, another person, 17, 1 through 8. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Mm. And then someone for 17, 1 through 8. Go ahead, John. When Abram was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession and to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So what are some of the promises in your cheat sheet is the timeline. Some of the promises God made to Abraham or Abram, then Abraham. <laughs> what are some of the promises? Make your descendants as numerous as the stars. Yeah. Nice, Becky. I like the sunglasses. I'll give them land. I'll give them land. Yeah. What else? 
it's pretty essential that his presence is, is with them. That's, that's kind of amazing. And the nations will be blessed in his seed. So um, a nice tidbit to know is that seed and offspring are the same word. Um, Zarat in um, Hebrew. So it, it, you could translate it offspring or seed. And he will be the father of many nations. So in Genesis 11.30, we're told that Sarah is barren, right? And yet God is promising that Abraham's line is going to be, his children are going to be as numerous as stars. And they are old, <laughs> like excessively old. Like I think they're in their 90s or something like that. And they... How could they, on earth, how, how would they even have a child, right? But God promises this. And um, here we see the importance of trusting God, that life can come out of the dead, right? So dead womb. Sarah has a dead womb, never been able to have children, and yet life is going to come out of there, out of, out of her womb. And God is the initiator. He's the one that's going to do it. Um, so Abraham believed what God had promised, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, you saw that with Noah. You're seeing it with Abraham. Paul shows the significance of this for all of redemption in Romans 4. So he, he goes into this whole section about Abraham in Romans 4. So you can look at that at your leisure. And the Abrahamic covenant begin. So here we go. We're going we're gonna to examine the Abrahamic covenant. So if we can look at Genesis 15, if anyone has their Bible handy. So in Genesis 15, it begins with the preamble and the historic prologue. So those are one and two in our, in our six points. Um, so the preamble is here, I should say, behold, and... Uh, listen to them sing. It's lovely. Um, sorry. 15, 7. Um, so, uh, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So that he's stating who he is. And he's also telling him what he's done. Um, stipulations to the covenant in, um, are found in 13 through 16. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So there are stipulations to that covenant. And then... Um, but notice here that this vassal is Yahweh. He's the one that's, that's saying what he will do, um, what the stipulations are. They're all on his part. So this is an unconditional covenant. It's not, con there's no conditions on the vas on the suzerain, which is the people of Israel. Um, so, that changes with Mosaic Covenant. That's completely opposite. So there's a lot of stipulations on the Isra Israelites, but we're flipping that, okay? Um, so the ancient... Oh, so there's a sacred ceremony that we find in Genesis 15, 9 through 11. And that is, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half 
over against the other. So he's making an aisle over against the aisle, other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And then um, you flip to um, 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flame torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your offspring, I give this land, the river, all those places. So the sacred ceremony is the binding element here. And the flame walking between the pieces is the Lord, right? So he's the one binding the agreement. He's the one making the promises. Um, and it ends with an oath. So the oath is the land of the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites. These are hard words to say. And the Jebusites. So he's giving, that is his oath, that he will give them the land. So um, let's see. Oh, one other note about the sacrificial ceremony. So the verb, um, so the verb in Hebrew literally means to cut a covenant. So it's not making a covenant, it's cutting one. And that's because the sacred ceremony is about cutting animals in half <laughs> and walking between them. So um, it, it's just an interesting piece. It's really literal in the ancient world that they are cutting a covenant. Um, and it, it, it's what makes the covenant binding. So the covenant is reaffirmed through the birth of Isaac. And as a sign of that covenant, every male among you shall be circumcised. So uh, Genesis 17, 10. I know it's profound, is it not? <laughs> it's, it, I, that was an aha moment for me in class when we actually examined what that verb was, cutting the covenant. All right, so the sacrifice of Isaac. So we've got another sacrifice going on here. And um, again, Abraham is trusting in the Lord and extraordinary ways. I can't imagine, uh, like, Joanne, he's, she's here just shaking her head. Can you imagine giving up your child as a sacrifice? Now, mind you, that is a practice in the ancient world, to give up your child as a sacrifice. It's something that God forbids later, right? But uh, so it wouldn't be unheard of for Isaac to have given up his son in a sacrifice. However, it didn't make a lot of sense, seeing as Isaac was born of this miracle of Sarah, and God had promised that, you know, out of Abraham, all nations would be born, and yet he's asking him to give up, by the way, his supernaturally given son, his begotten, his beloved son, just like Jesus, right? So we're going to see parallels between Isaac and Jesus here. So um, Isaac is a child born of the spirit. And that, that's where we start making the connection. It's supernatural, like Jesus and Mary, like Jesus is born of Mary, no father. Here, it's a little less worrisome because we do have Sarah and Abraham, but they're old, like really old. <laughs> so um, there is this supernatural element of birth given to these, these two children, Isaac and Jesus. So here we begin to see these parallels. And um, in Genesis 22, God tests Abraham with a sacrifice. And will he be able to sacrifice his beloved son? Is he willing to put God first and trust him? And this is, this is a question for all of us, right? Are we willing to put everything aside and follow God and what he wills us to do? It's a big, deep, profound question. I, I think of, um, obviously I've been hanging out with missionaries this week. I'm housing the dicks who are giving their presentation next door. And 
I've often thought of, am I willing to, and these, these, these missionaries in Haiti, the news today, that 17 of them are kidnapped by, you know, all of these, it's just crazy. But am I willing to give up my life? If I'm put in that, I don't, I'm not put in that position, right? Yeah, we have cultural things here that set us out and set us different from others, but I'm not at risk of losing my life to proclaim the gospel here. And so it, it just, it, it sits hard with me because I don't know what I would do. I don't, I don't know if I'd have the courage to um, be martyred and, or to give up my child as a sacrifice. So um, it kind of hits deep with me, um, especially since I have three children. <laughs> um, all right, so here's a nice little historical tidbit too. The sacrifice of Isaac takes place on Mount Moriah, uh, where David builds an altar in 1 Chronicles 21, and where King Solomon builds the temple. So this is a very, very important site. And it starts with Abram, Abraham then, sorry. <laughs> um, so turns out Abraham is willing to offer his son, though with much distress. I would imagine I'd be pretty distressed too. Um, but in the last moments, Yahweh intervenes and provides the sacrifice. And the Lord blesses Abraham and his offspring. So Abraham obeys, he's obedient to the Lord and the Lord provides the sacrifice and no longer does Isaac have to be sacrificed in the last moment. It's very dramatic, very dramatic. Um, it's very fun to read in the Hebrew, I have to say. I did a whole examination paper on that one. Um, and then one day as a conclusion to this, many years from then, God will offer up his beloved son to be a sacrifice, redeeming all humanity and restoring us to relationship with God. And this will be the new covenant. So this importance of covenants is going, this set, sets the stage, especially the Abrahamic covenant, covenant, sets the stage for the rest of the Old Testament. So um, as um, Carol would say, if you could sit down and read chapters 20 right on through the end of Genesis, you'll get a very clear idea of where the Old Testament is going and some very key theme, thematic concepts there. Um, so do I have any questions before we move to small groups? It's a lot, I know. Um, how do we know that Abraham, uh, no, I'm sorry, that Noah was a bad guy, for lack of a better term? Um, well, the whole, I mean, it's described that all of humanity is growing more and more corrupt. Um, it would be, where is, let's see, with Noah, right? So let's go back there. It's a little bit, so Genesis 6, Genesis 6, uh, verse 9 said, these are the family records of Noah, he was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries, Noah walked with God. So that was, that was, uh. But the part where I think uh, he's not viewed as a, uh, you know, as a holy, as a good man, a holy man was after the flood when he uh, might have showed his true self with getting drunk, building the wine, getting drunk, mm -hmm. and addicted, and, and, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. What does Carol say on that? Um, that's a good question. But I mean, so the, I think the, the point here, and I think John's right, like later, even though he was counted as righteous, he was a righteous man in and of his own behavior, he, he goes and he does that even though he knows God exists, right? And then he's done this miraculous thing. And I think the, that sets the stage for the rest of the world going forward, especially in Kings, where actually we were just talking about this a few minutes ago, where the Kings, okay, none of them are really good. Some of them are better than others. Some of them are horrible, right? So that's kind of all of humanity, well, yeah, that's right? What I was just going to say is that's no different than us knowing all the promises of 
God now and in the new covenant and the fact that we're justified and all, but it doesn't stop us from sinning. Right, right, right. And only the new covenant will rejoin us with a holy God. And that's, you know, that's the point of the law in Exodus is God is trying to find some way to have his people be able to commune with him. And, but we just keep sinning and we just keep, and we offer up lame sacrifices. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the eyes of the Lord, and I think part of her comment is that you don't have to do good things to find God's favor, mm. and in fact, that goes against the gospel, actually, that we have to do good things to have God's favor, right. and so part of her point is not necessarily, maybe he's not as bad as some other people, but that's beside the point. His good deeds or his attention to whatever things differently than the people at the time is not actually what matters. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord aside from whatever righteousness he had. Mm -hmm. God grants favor to who he decides to grant favor and not because of the things that we do. So yeah. I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. the broad view of and I think that's what um, the other New Testament reading with this, Galatians 3, 6 through 19, that's what Paul is alluding to, is that it's not about following the law. It's about walking by faith. Like That's how you become righteous. Um, I'm also going to send out another essay um, that Donna gave our class in Exodus that compares the uh, Mosaic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant with and and Galatians, um, that Galatians reading. So it, it's pretty fascinating. And um, so I think you might enjoy it if you if you like to go that way. Um, any other questions before we break? What was the covenant number four? Like covenant I number four um, is the Davidic covenant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That there will be a king. A big, great king. Yes, sir. Is articulated, these are so critical to understand the Old Testament, right? Because covenant number five is the new covenant, right? It's just there's a natural, it's like a river mm. flow down, you know. The first two are unconditional right. covenants, God's blessing on the earth through Noah and Abraham, especially through Abraham, right? And then the third one is very, is the old covenant, it's very dependent, blessed, blessed if you obey and cursed if you don't obey, right? So I, find, I think we all find the understanding of the five covenants is kind of a river. Mm. And there are different elements, too, like different aspects of the Old Testament um, promises. So.